now that we've finished with all the festivities, we can get down to some real math. Uh, the next speaker is Alex Eskin. He will talk on the SL2 action on moduli space. I should tell you that he's been trying to solve this problem since the day he finished his thesis, and so he's a very happy man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, this is really a, a talk about, uh, I wanted to explain how the beautiful ideas we heard in the first two talks by Benoit Khan have an application to something which seems maybe at first glance to be somewhat unrelated. But of course, you'll realize quickly that it is related. Uh, so anyway, I'm talking about the uh, problem I'm talking about is, is very, somehow very old, and it's still not. It's in the beginning of ergodic theory, people were talking about you know, looking for some simple models of dynamical systems. One of the simplest ones you can come up with is billiards in the polygon. So you have take an angle of incidence as angle of reflection. And you, know, you can ask all kinds of things about the system. For one of the things is, or people often do is like count periodic trajectories. So here is a question, you know, what, how many periodic trajectories are there of length at most t? And now, this is actually seems like a very difficult thing. It's a, I think people really quickly realize that this thing is not going to be easily done. And the best lower bound we have is 0. So even, even if they assume that the polygon is a triangle. Uh, the, there are some deep work of Richard Schwartz on this recently. But it's still, the, the problem remains unsolved. And the best upper bound is that the growth rate is sub-exponential. That's just because we know that the system has zero entropy. And so this is very little is known about the system in generality. Now I'm going to make a simplifying <laughs> assumption. We are assuming the polygon is rational. So that means that all angles are rational multiples of pi. And in that case, this problem actually has a lot of connections to other mathematics, in particular with Steichmuller theory. And here is, here is, for, here is a theorem, I think still the best theorem in the subject is that if you start with take a polygon, then the growth rate of periodic trajectories is quadratic. It's between two constants times t squared. I'm counting t as a Euclidean length of the trajectory. And the goal is to convert the upper and lower bound. This is here of Howard Mazur. So the goal is to convert this to an asymptotic formula and maybe to compute the constant. Uh, so. Uh, why are rational polygons better? Well, there is a very good, a very nice construction by, um, this is a, I think originally appeared in the paper of Zimnakov and Katok, but I think it might have been even earlier. And uh, so the idea is instead of uh, trajectories in the polygon change directions, but instead of reflecting the trajectory, you can re re uh, reflect the polygon itself. So. Here is, I did it for a, for a rectangle. And so, you know, instead of, uh, this pointer is, yeah, here. So instead of going like this, I can just go like that. So, you, uh, so in somehow you're going another copy of the polygon over here. And if, I, if you do this four times, then you can identify opposite sides of this flat torus. And then what, you, what happens is that, you know, instead of considering a billiard flow in the, in the polygon, you just consider straight line flow on the torus, where you always go in the same direction. And this is a completely equivalent system. Essentially, everything you can say about the first one is you can say about the second. Now, if you start do, doing with a slightly more complicated example, here as I took this triangle, and if you now reflect it again the, the, the same way, you end up with this regular n-gon, this regular pengon. And then you can actually glue opposite sides. So now, as you glue opposite sides, what happens is that all the points which are labeled green get identified with each other. And so do all the points which are labeled red. Because as you, when you glue, let's say, this side to this side, then you, you actually have to identify this point with that point, and so on. And, and uh, so this creates some sort of a surface. And again, the billiards in the polygon are just straight line flow on the surface. You keep on going in the same direction. 
Uh, so the total, if, you, if one looks at the surface, the total cone angle at this green point, which is the same as all these points, is really 4 pi. And uh, so these are kind of, con you get conical singularities, but the cone is not like an ice cream cone, it's something which is bigger than 2 pi. It's kind of like a multi-sheeted cover. Uh, so here I've drawn some periodic trajectories. So all of these trajectories are periodic because they just come back straight to themselves. One of the features of the system is that all periodic trajectories come in families. If you have one, then you can translate parallel to itself, and you'll get another one. And really, you end up with a whole cylinder of periodic trajectories. And so, I mean, of course, you know, the number of periodic trajectories is infinite, but you just, what, you, what you really need to do is count the number of cylinders. Uh, so... Now, the objects that you get out of this are called flat surfaces. And I, I want to describe several points of view on those things. So the first one is just completely elementary. And the second is also elementary, but slightly different language. So if you just try to take polygons and glue them together, what kind of objects do you get? Well, you get something, you get something that's a flat metric, which is non-singular outside of some finite number of conical singularities. And these are coming from the vertices of the polygon. Now, the a flat metric has trivial holonomy, which means trace lines make sense. And it also means that if you go, along, go around any closed path, you kind of, the tangent vector comes back to itself. Uh, it, so that actually means that all cone angles have, integer, have to be integer multiples of 2 pi. And then actually, this is a convention. We, we somehow think of these things as oriented. So we, we think of the, like a direction to the north as having being part of the flat structure. So if you rotate the surface, you get a different flat structure, you get a different flat surface. And then if you have a conical singularity with total angle 2 pi, and then has n directions going to the north. So now in this language, I can describe, it turns out that, you know, so by replacing the polygon by this flat surface, it certainly you kind of, it's easier to understand what happens on the surface because you're only going in one direction. But it turns out you actually gain a lot more than that. What really, what you've gained is you've gained, now there is, there is an action of the group SL2R on, the, on, on these flat surfaces. And I want to just describe it really quickly. So what a flat surface is really a union of polygons sitting inside R2. And they're glued together along parallel side, and each side is glued exactly one other side. So here's an example. So people tend to draw like a genus two surface, you know, most people would draw it like a, like a bagel. Okay, now that we've finished with all the festivities, we can get down to some real math. Uh, the next speaker is Alex Eskin. He will talk on the SL2 action on moduli space. I should tell you that he's been trying to solve this problem since the day he finished his thesis, and so he's a very happy man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, so... Uh, this is really a, a talk about, uh, I wanted to explain how the beautiful ideas we heard in the first two talks by Benoit and Khan have an application to something which seems maybe at first glance to be somewhat unrelated. But of course you'll realize quickly that it is related. Uh, so anyway, I'm talking about, the uh, problem I'm talking about is 
somehow very old, and it's still not. It's in the beginning of ergodic theory. People were talking about you know looking for some simple models of dynamical systems. One of the simplest ones you can come up with is the billiards in the polygon. So you have take a angle of incidence as angle of reflection. And you know you can ask all kinds of things about the system. Well, one of the things that uh, people often do is like count periodic trajectories. So here is a question, you know, what, how many periodic trajectories are there of length at most t? And now this is actually seems like a very difficult thing. It's a, I think people really quickly realize this, this thing is not going to be easily done. And the best lower bound we have is zero. So even, even if we assume that the polygon is a triangle. Uh, the, there are some deep work of Richard Schwartz on this recently, but it's still, the, the problem remains unsolved. And the best upper bound is that the growth rate is sub-exponential. That is because we know that the system has zero entropy. And so this is, very little is known about the system in generality. Now I'm going to make a simplifying <laughs> assumption we are assuming the polygon is rational. So that means that all angles are rational multiples of pi. And in that case, this problem actually has a lot of connections to other mathematics, in particular with Steichmuller theory. And here is, here, is, here is the theorem. I think it's still the best theorem in the subject, is that if you start with take a polygon, then the growth rate of periodic trajectories is quadratic. It's between two constants times t squared. I'm counting t as a Euclidean length of the trajectory. And the goal is to convert the upper and lower bound. This is theorem of Howard Mazur. So the goal is to convert this to an asymptotic formula and maybe to compute the constant. Uh, so uh, why are rational polygons better? Well, there is a very good, a very nice construction by, um, this is the, I think originally appeared in the paper of Zimnakov and Katok, but I think it might have been even earlier. And uh, so the idea is instead of polyg uh, trajectories in the polygon change directions, but instead of reflecting the trajectory, you can re re uh, reflect the polygon itself. So here is, I did it for a, for a rectangle. And so, you know, instead of, uh, So instead of going like this, I can just go like that. So, you, uh, so in somehow you're going another copy of the polygon over here. And if, I, if you do this four times, then you can identify opposite sides of this flat torus. And then what, you, what happens is that you know instead of considering a billiard flow in the, in the polygon, you just consider straight line flow in the torus. So you always go in the same direction. And this is a completely equivalent system. Essentially, everything you can say about the first one is you can say about the second. Now, if you start do doing with a slightly more complicated example, here is I took this triangle, and if you now reflect it again the, the, the same way, you end up with this regular n-gon, this regular pengon, and then you can actually glue opposite sides. So now, as you glue opposite sides, what happens is that all the points which are labeled green get identified with each other, and so do all the points which are labeled red, because as you, uh, when you glue, let's say, this side to this side, then you, are, you actually have to identify this point with that point and so on. And, and uh, so this creates some sort of a surface. And again, the billiards in the polygon are just straight line flow on the surface. You just keep on going in the same direction. Uh, so the total, if, you, if one looks at the surface, the total cone angle at this green point, which is the same as all these points, is really 4 pi. And uh, so these are kind of, con you get conical singularities, but the cone is not like an ice cream cone, it's something just bigger than 2 pi. It's kind of like a multi-sheeted cover. Uh, so here I've drawn some periodic trajectories. So all of these trajectories are periodic, because they come back straight to themselves. One of the features of the system that all periodic trajectories come in families. If you have one, then you can translate parallel to itself, and you'll get another one. And really, you end up with a whole cylinder of periodic trajectories. And so, I mean, of course, you know, the number of periodic trajectories is infinite, but you just, when you, what you need to do is count the number of cylinders. Uh, so 
Now, the objects that you get out of this are called flat surfaces. And I, I want to describe several points of view on those things. So the first one is just completely elementary, and the second one is also elementary, but slightly different language. So if you just try to take polygons and glue them together, what kind of objects do you get? Well, you get something, you get something that's a flat matrix, which is non-singular outside of some finite number of conical singularities. And these are coming from the vertices of the polygon. Now, the, a flat metric has trivial holonomy, which means trace lines make sense. And it also means that if you go, along, go around any closed path, you kind of, the tangent vector comes back to itself. Uh, it, so that actually means that all cone angles have, integer, have to be integer multiples of 2 pi. And then actually, this is a convention. We, we somehow think of these things as oriented. So we, we think of the, like a direction to the north as having being part of the flat structure. So if you rotate the surface, you get a different flat structure, you get a different flat surface. And then if you have a conical singularity with total angle 2 pi, and then has n directions going to the north. So now in this language, I can describe, it turns out that, you know, so by replacing the polygon by this flat surface, it's certainly you kind of, it's easier to understand what happens on the surface because you're only going in one direction. But it turns out you actually gain a lot more than that. What really, what you've gained is you've gained, now there is, there is an action of the group SL2R on, the, on, on these flat surfaces. And I want to just describe it really quickly. So what a flat surface is really a union of polygons sitting inside R2. And they're glued together along parallel side, and each side is glued exactly one other side. So here's an example. So people tend to draw like a genus to a surface, you know, most people would draw it like a, like a bagel. And I want to try to convince you that you should really draw it less, like three squares like that. Uh, so, uh, so if you have an element of SL2R, then SL2R acts on R2, so it acts on the polygons. So you get new polygons. I just did that. And the point is that, of course, the action, uh, act, you know, you're, you had identification along parallel lines in the original polygon. Uh, but so now you still have identification along parallel lines. Uh, so you can identify. So this actually does make sense. Action of SL2 preserves not in parallel lines. So this, uh, this is one way to describe the action. Now, there is, there is a different language for all of this, which is, I think, in, sounds a little bit more scientific. It's certainly useful in other ways. So I can think about uh, holonom uh, surfaces holomorphic one forms. So here is, uh, here is a, a, a situation. Imagine you start with a, a flat surface, and I can actually associate to it a Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form in a canonical way. And this happens in sort of very naturally because if you have a, a flat surface, you kind of essentially all it is is it's a union of you know, polygons where the identifications are by translation. So now translation is certainly a holomorphic map, which means that the, you know, if you think of DZ as a coordinate on the plane, that's, that's sort of well defined. It's a, it's a transition functions are holomorphic. Uh, and uh, so you, you get a you get a holomorphic uh, structure on the surface, and it actually it's you can stare a little bit more. You can see it actually extends to the conical points as well. And now, if you consider uh, the holomorphic one form dz on the complex plane, and then the the coordinate z is not globally defined, but it's because again because the changes in local coordinates are defined as z are just translations, D, DZ is actually well defined. So the holomorphic one form DZ on C defines a holomorphic one form on the Riemann surface, which is, which is uh, associated with this whole structure. And it turns out that this holomorphic one form has zeros at exactly those points where the flat structure has singularity. So this is, uh, you can also go backwards. Uh, from a, from a pair where you have a Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form on it, you actually get a flat structure. And it's, it's actually very simple. It's essentially, at the neighborhood of every point, you 
can consider consider uh, where the homomorphism one form is non-zero. You can think of a local coordinates where there is a local coordinate in which the holomorphic one form is a DZ, and this local coordinate is unique up to translation. And so what if you actually use this kind of charts around every point, then you'll get a whole bunch of charts where the transition functions are translations, which is exactly the flat surface structure. So this is, so this is just a different point of view of looking at, uh, at the same structure. And now in the neighborhood of a zero, then yeah, you have to be a little bit more careful. The holomorphic one form is def and defined this way, and then you get a conical point to this cone angle, 2 pi times the degree of the zero plus one. So now the moduli space of pairs, a holomorphic structure, uh, complex structure, holomorphic one form is naturally stratified by, we call those the strata. These are just the partitions because the holomorphic one form has 2g minus 2 zero. So you just stratify it by specifying the multiplicities of the zeros of the one form. So this gives you stratification of the moduli space of pairs. Uh, somehow one of the themes of, uh, is that you can actually look at the modular space of Riemann surfaces itself, uh, or you can look at the modular space of pairs with Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form. And somehow the second space is somehow much more homogeneous in the first one. It's sort of a weird phenomenon. Um, so now there is, there is a local coordinate system on this space. So for a for a path, you just define the whole number of the path, just integrate the one form along the path. But now, of course, the, the actually, let me just try to draw the, my favorite flat surface. So actually, maybe I want to triangulate it. So I have this thing, opposite sides are identified and so on. So if I integrate the path, then uh, if I, so is the holomorphic one form is just dz. So this means that uh, if I integrate dz, so the integrals of the, if I pick this as my path, then the integral of dz is just this vector, is sitting as a vector in R2. So basically the, the coordinates are really, you know, so I, I specify the set of singularities, so maybe just here would be just the, the angle to the triangulation, and then in my relative, uh, my, my coordinates will be just is the vectors of, of the triangles, the sides of the triangles. But the way I'm, the way I'm thinking about it is that you know, there are too many sides because uh, if you, whenever you have a triangle like this, uh, the, si the, si the, si the sides have to be zero. So you, the sides of the triangles are themselves now coordinates and you have constraints. So the correct way to say what the constraints are is you just say, well, I'm going to pick a basis for this relative homology group, which is uh, you look at the surface modulo its singularities, S is M, by the way. It modulo its singularities with Z coefficients. And then you just get this map from, so if I pick a, real, pick a basis, then I can just look at the integral of the holomorphic one form along the basis, and I get a local coordinate system on, on my space. So basically, it just says that the sides of the triangles determine the surface. It's not a very deep statement. Uh, so now there is a measure on, on, on the space, which is you just pull back from the bag measure on this uh, coordinate system. And the coordinate system is basically well defined up to some sort of symplectic change of variable, uh, change of basis, and that preserves measures. So, so, uh, so it's determined one matrix. So you get a measure on the space, which is naturally, naturally well defined. And there is a uh, very nice theorem of Mazur and Veach, which basically says that if you restrict this to surfaces of a area one, I mean, then this measure is finite. So you already have a finite measure space. So here is sort of a dictionary of what I did so far. If you look at flat structures, then that's the same as a complex structure and a holomorphic one form. Flat structure is a complex structure in the holomorphic one form, and now conical point is a, corresponds to a zero of the holomorphic one form. Now side of the polygon corresponds to a relative period of the one form. And then the family of uh, flat surfaces sharing the same cone angles is the same as 
a stratum in the moduli space of holomorphic one form. And again, the coordinates in the family are just vert vertices corresponding to an independent set of edges in a triangulation, and this is just the cohomology class of omega itself in this relative cohomology group, where you look at the, the, the surface modulo is the a singular point. Okay. So now I wanted to somehow st start again. So this is just a description of the space. Now, this is going to be a little bit slow for this audience, but still. So there is, here is the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. So what's ergodic theorem? Well, it's, I think you all know what it is. If you have a space, you have a map. Measure is called ergodic if every invariant subset has either measure 0 or 1. And then the Birkhoff ergodic theorem says that this is the average along the orbit converges to the average along the space. This is for almost all points. But this has one weakness. I mean, this is a fundamental result, obviously, but it has one weakness. What if we want to know what happens for every point? This is, I think, now you could recognize why this is related to the physics stuff. Uh, so there is, there is a, why do we care about what happens to every point? Because in, it, suppose you want to act on the polygons. So you get new polygons. I just did that. And the point is that, of course, the action, it, uh, act, you know, your, you had identification along parallel lines in the original polygon. Uh, but so now you still have identification along parallel lines. Uh, so you can identify. So that this actually does make sense. So maybe this <laughs> action of SL2 preserves not in parallel lines. So this, uh, this is one way to describe the action. Now, there is, there is a different language for all of this, which is, I think, in, sounds a little bit more scientific. It's certainly useful in other ways. So I can speak about uh, uh, surfaces of holomorphic one forms. So here is, uh, here is a, a, a situation. Imagine you start with a, a flat surface, and I can actually associate to it a Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form in a canonical way. And this happens in sort of very naturally because if you have a, a flat surface, you kind of essentially all it is is it's a union of you know, polygons where the identifications are by translation. So now translation is suddenly a holomorphic map, which means that the, you know, if you think of dz as a coordinate on the plane, that's, that's sort of well defined. So it's a transition functions are holomorphic. Uh, and so you, you get a you get a holomorphic uh, structure on the surface. And it actually, it's, you can stare a little bit more. You can see it actually extends to the conical points as well. And now, if you consider uh, the holomorphic one form dz on the complex plane, and then the, the coordinate z is not globally defined, but it's because, again, because the changes in local coordinates are defined as z are just translations, d, dz is actually well defined. So the holomorphic one form dz on c defines a holomorphic one form on the Riemann surface, which is, which is uh, associated with this whole structure. And it turns out that this holomorphic one form has zeros at exactly those points where the flat structure has singularity. So this is, uh, you can also go backwards uh, from, a from a pair where you have a Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form on it. You actually get a flat structure. And it's, it's actually very simple. It's essentially, at the neighborhood of every point, you can consider, consider where the holomorphic one form is non-zero. You can think of a local coordinate where there is a local coordinate in which the holomorphic one form is just dz. And this local coordinate is unique up to translation. And so what, if you actually use this kind of charts around every point, then you'll get a whole bunch of charts where the transition functions are translations, which exactly the flat surface structure. So this is, so this is just a different point of view of looking at, uh, at the same structure. And now in the neighborhood of a zero, then yeah, you have to be a little bit more careful. The holomorphic one form is de de defined this way, and then you get a conical point to this cone angle to pi times the degree of the zero plus one. So now the moduli space of pairs, a holomorphic structure, uh, complex structure, holomorphic one form is naturally stratified by, we call those the strata. 
these are just the partitions because the holomorphic one form has two g minus two zeros. So you just stratify it by specifying the multiplicities of the zeros of the one form. So that gives you stratification of this moduli space of pairs. Uh, somehow one of the themes of, uh, is that you can actually look at the moduli space of Riemann surfaces itself uh, or you can look at the moduli space of pairs with Riemann surface and a holomorphic one form. And somehow the second space is somehow much more homogeneous in the first one. So it's sort of a weird phenomenon. Um, so now there is, there is a local coordinate system on this space. So for a for a path, you just define the whole name of the path, just integrate the one form along the path. But now, of course, the, the actually, let me just try to draw the, my favorite flat surface. So actually, maybe I want to triangulate it. So I have this thing, opposite sides are identified and so on. So if I integrate the path, then uh, if I, so is the holomorphic one form is just dz. So this means that uh, if I integrate dz, so the integrals of the, if I pick this as my path, then the integral of dz is just this vector, is sitting as a vector in R2. So basically the, the coordinates are really, you know, so I, I specify the set of singularities, so maybe just here would be just the, the angles of the triangulation, and then in my relative, uh, my, my coordinates will be just is the vectors of, of the triangles, the sides of the triangles. But the way I'm, the way I'm thinking about it is that you know, there are too many sides because uh, if you, whenever you have a triangle like this, uh, the, si the, si the sides have to be zero. So you, the sides of the triangles are themselves. Now coordinate system, you have constraints. So the correct way to say what the constraints are is you just say, well, I'm going to pick a basis for this relative homology group, which is uh, you look at the surface modulo its singularities, S is M, by the way. It modulo its singularities with Z coefficients. And then you just get this map from, so you, if I pick a, real, pick a basis and I can just look at the integral of the holomorphic one form along the basis and I get a local coordinate system on, on my space. So basically it just says that the sides of the triangles determine the surface. It's not a very deep statement. So now there is a measure on, on, on the space, which is you just pull back from the bag measure on this uh, coordinate system. And the coordinate system is basically well defined up to some sort of symplectic change of variable, uh, change of basis, and that's preserves measures. Uh, so, uh, so it's determinant one matrix. So you get a measure on the space, which is naturally, naturally well defined. And there is a uh, very nice theorem of Mazur and Veach, which basically says that if you restrict this to surfaces of a area one, I mean, then this measure is finite. So you already have a finite measured space. So here is sort of a dictionary of what I did so far. If you look at flat structures, then that's the same as a complex structure and a holomorphic one form. Flat structure is a complex structure in the holomorphic one form, and now conical point is a, corresponds to a zero of the holomorphic one form. Now side of the polygon corresponds to a relative period of the one form. And then the family of uh, flat surfaces sharing the same cone angles is the same as a stratum in this moduli space of holomorphic one form. And again, the coordinates in the family are just vert vertices corresponding to independent set of edges in a triangulation, and this is just the cohomology class of omega itself in this relative cohomology group, where you look at the, the, the surface modulo is the a singular point. Okay. So now I wanted to somehow st start again. So this is just a description of the space. Now, this is going to be a little slow for this audience, but still. So there is, here is the Burkhoff ergodic theorem. So what's a ergodic theorem? Well, it's, I think you all know what it is. If you have a space, you have a map, measure is called ergodic if every invariant subset has either measure zero or one, and then the Burkhoff ergodic theorem says that this is a average along the orbit converges to the average along the space. This is for almost all points. But this has one weakness. 
I mean, this is a fundamental result, obviously, but it has one weakness. What if we want to know what happens for every point? This is, I think, now you could recognize why this is related to the physics stuff. Uh, so there is, there is a, why do we care about what happens to every point? Because in, it, suppose you want to solve this problem about polygons. So if you look at the polygons inside this moduli space of flat surfaces, which you get by, this, look at this, the set in the actual space of flat surfaces, which you get by actually unrolling a polygon, this is the set of measure zero. It's kind of, it's essentially flat surface in axis symmetry. Yeah. And uh, so this means that any sort of ergodic theorem about, uh, which works almost everywhere in the space of flat surfaces will say nothing at all about polygons. So here is an example. This is, if you're using some general Gothic theorems, by general Gothic things, I mean theorems which work on action on any space. One can prove a theorem like this. This is uh, how amazing and I prove one version is really based on work of Beach on this. So, you know, if, you, if I look at the number of periodic, this is the problem we are trying to solve, is asymptotic of this number, which is the number of periodic trajectories uh, up to length t. Well, almost everywhere in the space of flat surfaces, there is an isosymptotic formula. And you can spend a lot of time figuring out what this number is, which is actually has its own theory, but I don't want to spend talk about it. But again, this, the problem with this thing is it says nothing at all about polygons. Just it's a completely empty statement about polygons. By the way, I actually, I, I actually had an interaction with a physicist once, but I, I, I think I, I talked to him once about this problem, and he said, well, what do you believe is true for all polygons? I think, well, I believe this is probably true for polygons as well. He said, but you're contradicting yourself. In your paper, you said that this says nothing about polygons. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so, so so you kind of want to have ergodic, you want to try to go beyond the Birkhoff ergodic theorem and similar theorems. So you, there is one kind of classical situation in dynamical systems where you have, understand all orbits, is called a uniquely ergodic system. It's, it's whenever you have a, a single invariant measure. And so if you have a uniquely ergodic system and then and you have a compact space, then, then it's actually true for any continuous function for all points that the space of the average along the orbit converges to the average along the space. And so I'm, I'm not going to give any proof, but I think I'll give this one real quickly because I think it's, I'll, I'll refer to the proof a little bit later. It's very, very short. So here, here is how you, you prove this. Birkhoff theorem is hard. This is actually very, very easy. So here is, you define, I'm going to make a measure, which measure dual to the function. So on the function, it does this, just average along the or first ten points of the orbit. Then this measure has this property that if you co compose f with t and subtract what you have from f, you have this big cancellation that some only the first and last term have, uh, uh, cancel on the first time. So this means that if you now take any weak star limit of these measures, which of course exists because I assume the space is weak star compact, then this thing will go to zero because f is bound and this one over n will kill everything. And this means that the limit measure will have to be invariant under T. So any limit measure is invariant under T, but then, of course, I, I assume there is only one invariant measure, so therefore the limit measure has to be new. And this really tells you that this measures new and converge to new, which is what we wanted to prove to begin with. So this is a very, very simple argument. Uh, I wanted to basically note two points out of this. First, what, is, what we are really using here is the amenability of Z, because Single transformation, same as the action of Z, and this cancellation is really just the fact that Z is amenable. That's, some, that's very important. And so whenever you have an amenable group, you can put, in, put a measure on every closure of every orbit. So I guess I'll get back to this and show you the data. Okay, so now there is, a, there is one, other, there is one such other situation which, I mean, very well known, and it's actually very, very powerful. Where I, uh, the problem with uniquely ergodic systems is that it's nice when, that, when you have them, but what, what this basically says is that every orbit behaves the same. So if you, when, if imagine you have a situation where some, some orbit is closed, but not every orbit is closed. Then that cannot be uniquely ergodic. So uniquely ergodic systems are very restricted. I mean, they have a lot of applications, but what if you, you're talking about something that's not uniquely ergodic? So here is a, there is a one system where, I mean, I think, I think there's very few, but maybe outside of homogeneous space, I actually don't know any systems like that. So here is a system where you understand every orbit. This is a uni, for unipotent flow. So uh, here is a, suppose you have a unipotent one, so he, my space X is gonna be G mod gamma. So G is a simple Lie group gamma is a lattice. So it's, we are in, in a, 
setting of the previous talk, and then I have u as a uniform one parameter subgroup. Then u acts on this by last multiplication. This is sometimes called the horocycle flow. And so here is, here is a theorem of Ratner, which all three of those things basically say in different ways that we understand what happens to every orbit. And the first one says that any invariant measure is itself homogeneous. So it's a, it's a measure in which is in that, it's supported on the closed orbit of some bigger subgroup. It's actually invariant in the closed orbit of some bigger, of some sub intermediate subgroup in U and G. And the second one is saying that the closure of every orbit is itself a closed orbit of some intermediate subgroup. I think we already had this. We saw this in the first talk. And the third one is actually, I don't want to state in any sort of precise way, but the, you can Im imagine what saying that any orbit is uniformly distributed in its closure. Its closure itself is a homogeneous manifold. So any orbit is uniformly distributed in some homogeneous submanifold. So this is, uh, this is, again, makes possible to understand all orbits. And I think it's also, uh, just note that all of those theorems are extremely false if you, for example, if, you somehow don't expect this to be true in any sort of generality. I mean, you, it's false if, for example, if you replace u by one parameter diagonalizable subgroups, because then you can have, find all kinds of complicated behavior, like the orbit closures can be counterfeits and so on. I mean, you can, for example, if you talk about geodesic flow on the surface, you can actually find something which spirals along a closed geodesic and somehow, spiral, somehow follows a closed geodesic for a while, then starts following some other closed geodesic for a while. We can have all kinds of extremely complicated behavior. And so part of the statement of the theorem is for all horror cycles, this never happens. You know, horror cycles just never do anything weird. So now I'm going to put in some, it is always a mistake to put something you don't understand on the slide, but I think I did, I'll do it anyway. So here are some, some, I mean, this is a very partial list of applications. This, this theorem has very, theory, uniform flows has very many, many different applications. So number theory and also to other places. And so the Oppenheim conjecture is really not an application because it predated the theorem. So it's, it's certainly part of the, I mean, it was, I mean, the proof of the Oppenheim condition by Margulis is also many of the, uses many of the same ideas and it's really <coughs> part, of, part of the theory, uh, the original part of the theory. It's all based on. The, then there is the quantitative Oppenheim conjecture. This is also has an asterisk because Nobody conjectured this. Yeah, so by the way, so the, uh, the, the, the way to make this list is there are very many different things. Facing this. I mean, I, I could probably fill like about 10 or 20 slides with this. The way to make, get on this list is to use the word conjecture in either the statement of the theorem or in the abstract. So that, that's how, the, how I selected for this particular application. So the quantitative Oppenheim conjecture is, a, yeah, it's in the statement, but it's not. It's a quantitative version of Oppenheim's conjecture. Nobody really conjectured this one. Uh, then, you know, there are some cases of Minion's conjecture on counting rational points, uh, if people in the audience. Uh, there are some cases of L values of L function in the middle spherical strip. And, there are, and now this is stuff I, I, I mean, the Andrea Oz conjecture, well, it's certainly not part of the development. I think I should put it here anyway, but it's certainly not part of what we're going to hear about tomorrow, but it's still, you know, people have tried to use this technology to solve this problem as well. Uh, the, I mean, maybe I'll also make some other uh, remarks, some other things I li really like a lot. There is, if you look at gaps in the distribution of n squared alpha mod one, this is also can be applied using uniform flows and Ratner's theorem, this is the theorem of Elkos and McMullen. And then there also is an application to mathematical physics. If you look at the three path lengths in the periodic Lorentz gas, this is what Mott's often says, strongly referring to. There, there are many, many others. So I'm just saying that somehow having a, this kind of control over dynamical system well, this, this dynamical system gives a lot of, gives you strength to like, so, solve a lot of problems completely outside the field. I mean, most of those things have really nothing to do with robotic theory. Uh, so anyway, uh, now I want to go back to this problem about polygons. So if you look at the polygons inside this moduli space of flat surfaces, which you get by, this, look at this, the set in the actual space of flat surfaces, which you get by actually unrolling a polygon, this is a set of measure zero. It's kind of, it's essentially flat surface with an axis symmetry. Which, yeah. And uh, so this means that any sort of ergodic theorem 
about, uh, which works almost everywhere in the space of flat surfaces, will say nothing at all about polygons. So here's an example. This is, if you're using some general Galois theorems, by general Galois theorems, I mean theorems which work on action on any space. One can prove a theorem like this. This is uh, how amazing I prove one version is really based on work of Veach on this. So, you know, if, you, if I look at the number of periodic, this is the problem we are trying to solve is asymptotic of this number, which is the number of periodic trajectories uh, up to let's t. Well, almost everywhere in the space of flat surface, there is an isosymptotic formula. And you can spend a lot of time figuring out what this number is, which is actually has its own theory, but I don't want to spend talk about it. But again, this, the problem with this thing is it says nothing at all about polygons. Completely empty statements about polygons. By the way, I actually, I, I actually had an interaction with a physicist once, where I, I, I think I, I talked to him once about this problem, and he says, "Well, what do you believe is true for all polygons?" I think, "Well, I believe this is probably true for polygons as well." He said, "But you're contradicting yourself. In your paper, you said that this says nothing about polygons." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so. So, so you kind of want to have ergodic, you want to try to go beyond Birkhoff ergodic theorem and similar theorems. So yeah, there is one kind of classical situation in dynamical systems where you have, understand all orbits, is called a uniquely ergodic system. It's, it's whenever you have a, a single invariant measure. And so if you have a uniquely ergodic system and then you have, and you have a compact space, then, then it's actually true for any continuous function for all points that the space of the average along the orbit converges to the average along the space. And so I'm, I'm not going to give any proof, but I think I'll give this one real quickly because I think it's, I'll, I'll refer to the proof a little bit later. It's very, very short. So here, here is how you, you prove this. Birkhoff theorem is hard. This is actually very, very easy. So here is, you define, I'm going to make a measure which measures dual to the function. So on the function, it does this, just average along the or first ten points of the orbit. Then this measure has this property that if you com compose f with t and subtract what you have from f, you have this big cancellation that some only the first and last term have, uh, uh, cancel on the first time. So this means that if you now take any weak star limit of these measures, which of course exists because I assume the space is weak star compact, then this thing will go to zero because f is bound and this one over n will kill everything. And this means that the limit measure will have to be invariant under t. So any limit measure is invariant under t, but then, of course, I, I assume there is only one invariant measure, so therefore the limit measure has to be new. And this really tells you that this measures new and converge to new, which is what we wanted to prove to begin with. So this is a very, very simple argument. Uh, I wanted to basically note two points out of this. First, what, is, what we are really using here is the amenability of z, because Single transformation, same as the action of z. And this cancellation is really just the fact that z is amenable. That's, some, that's very important. And so whenever you have an amenable group, you can put, in, put a measure on every closure of every orbit. So I'll get, get back to it and show you the data. OK, so now there is, a, there is one, other, there is one situ other situation which, I mean, very well known, and it's actually very, very powerful. Where I, uh, the problem with uniquely ergodic systems is that it's nice when, that, when you have them, but what, what this basically says is that every orbit behaves the same. So if you, when, if imagine you have a situation where some, some orbit is closed, but not every orbit is closed. Then that cannot be uniquely ergodic. So uniquely ergodic systems are very restrictive. I mean, they have a lot of applications, but what if you, you're talking about something that's not uniquely ergodic? So here is a, there is a one system where, I mean, I think, I think there's very few, but maybe outside of homogeneous space, I actually don't know any systems like that. So here is a system where you understand every orbit. This is a uni, for unipotent flow. So uh, here is a, suppose you have a unipotent one, so he, my space X is gonna be G mod gamma. So G is some simple group gamma is a lattice. So it's then in the setting of the previous talk. And then I have U is a unipotent one parameter sub -width. Then U acts on this by left multiplication. This is sometimes called the Horos cycle flow. And so here is, here is a theorem of Ratner, which all three of those things basically say in different ways that we understand what happens to every orbit. And the first one says that any invariant measure is itself homogeneous. So it's a, it's a measure in which is in that, which is supported on the closed orbit of some bigger subgroup. It's actually invariant in the closed orbit of some bigger, of some sub intermediate subgroup in U and G. And the second one is saying that the closure of every orbit is itself a closed orbit of some intermediate subgroup. 
I think you, we already had this. So you saw this in the first talk. And the third one is actually, I don't want to say it in any sort of precise way, but uh, you can Im imagine what saying is any orbit is uniformly distributed in this closure. So the closure itself is a homogeneous manifold. So any orbit is uniformly distributed in some homogeneous set manifold. So this is, uh, this is, again, makes possible to understand all orbits. And I think it's also, uh, just want to note that all of those theorems are extremely false if you, for example, if you somehow don't expect this to be true in any sort of generality. I mean, you, it's false if, for example, if you replace u by one parameter diagonalizable subgroups, because then you can have, find all kinds of complicated behavior, like the orbit closures can be Cantor sets and so on. I mean, you can, for example, if you talk about geodesic flow on the surface, you can actually find something which spirals along a closed geodesic and somehow, spir somehow follows a closed geodesic for a while, then starts following some other closed geodesic for a while. You can have all kinds of extremely complicated behavior. And so part of the statement of the theorem is for all horror cycles, this never happens. You know, horror cycles just never do anything weird. So now I'm going to put in some, it is always a mistake to put something you don't understand on the slide, but I think I did, I'll do it anyway. So here are some, some, I mean, this is a very partial list of applications. This, this theorem has very, theory, uniform flows has very many, many different applications. So number theory and also to other places. And so the Oppenheim conjecture is really not an application because it predated the theorem. So it's, it's certainly part of the, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, the proof of the Oppenheim conjecture by Margulis is also many of the, uses many of the same ideas and it's really <coughs> part, of, part of the theory, uh, the original part of the theory, which it's all based on. The, then there is the quantitative Oppenheim conjecture. This is also has an asterisk because nobody conjectured this. Yeah, so by the way, so the, uh, the, the, the way to make this list is there are very many different things. Facing this. I mean, I, I could probably fill like about 10 or 20 slides with this. The way to make, get on this list is to use the word conjecture in either the statement of the theorem or in the abstract. So that, that's how, the, how I was selected for this particular application. So the quantitative Oppenheim conjecture is, a, yeah, it's in the statement, but it's not. It's a quantitative version of Oppenheim's conjectures. Nobody really conjectures this one. Uh, then, you know, there are some cases of Minion's conjecture on counting rational points, there is people in the audience. Uh, there are some cases of L values of L function in the middle critical step. And, there are, and now this is stuff I, I, I mean, the Andrea Oll conjecture, well, it's certainly not part of the development. I think I should put it here anyway, but it's certainly not part of what we're gonna hear about tomorrow, but it's still, you know, people have tried to use this technology to solve this problem as well. Uh, the, I mean, maybe I'll also make some other uh, remarks, some other things I li really like a lot. There is, if you look at gaps in the distribution of n squared alpha mod one, this is also can be applied using uniform flows and rational theorem, this is the theorem of Elkus and McMullen. And then there also here's an application of mathematical physics. If you look at this three path lengths in the periodic Lorentz gas, this is what Mark Falcon is strong based on. There are, there are many, many others. So I'm just saying that somehow having a, this kind of control over dynamical system, well, this, this dynamical system gives a lot of gives you some strength to like, so solve a lot of problems completely outside the field. I mean, most of those things have really nothing to do with robotic theory. Uh, so anyway, uh, now I want to go back. There's some sort of a formula, uh, you know. Uh, well, there is some sort of integral formula for this, which is the integral over some orbit. And uh, there is, uh, in the quantitative Oppenheim situation, you count something different. I'm gonna count, uh, I'm gonna call it like this. This is again some sort of other formula. And uh, the, somehow the problems look different, but it turns out that these expressions are really the same. They're somehow this, they're, they're not, they don't look this, they, they, you can even use the same letters and then you wouldn't know if you, uh, which problem you're working on, except one problem is happening on uh, SLN R modulo SLN Z, and the other one happens on the modular space approach. So, and this actually was understood by Veach. He actually understood this while he was listening to Margulis talk about the quantitative Oppenheim conjecture. So this is some relation between the subjects. Uh, so, now, since the work of Veach, one, one, one would, uh, sort of, one uh, question was, uh, what extent can one 
sort of use the theory of unipotent flows and multiply space. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, so first, there is a, there is a modulus, I mean, modulus space is somehow, uh, Ratner theorem and this kind of stuff is, is really, you expect to only work in very, very nice situations. And now modulus space is very nice, has an awful lot of structure. It's certainly not homogeneous, but it's still, I mean, if it's gonna work anywhere, it's gonna work there. Uh, but, uh, so here is one particular structure of modulus space which seems particularly relevant. So, I mean, I think I already mentioned these local coordinate systems. So if, you, if I pick a symplectic basis for the relative homology group, then I have this local coordinate system. So I can associate to, I associate to a, a point in my space, this kind of, inter, just integrate my one form along the curve. So I get a, a, something in CN, which I want to write as R2 to the end. So it's a two by n matrix. So now the SL2 action in these coordinates is actually very simple. You just, you take, this is your, your point in your space, you just multiply on the left by SL2. But what happens is that uh, this is the, uh, somehow, if, maybe if I should try to draw, draw some sort of symbolic picture, this is a fundamental domain, here is my point X, and when I apply G X, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the fundamental domain. And then if I, if I want to think about my dynamics that's happening on the fundamental domain, then there is, I have to return. And this is, I think, some, this is called the, co the co-cycle, I'll call it AGX. So I return back to the fundamental domain. And this is, this is called the conservage zorich co-cycle. And it's, it's really the, it's a change of basis you need to perform to return this point back to the fundamental domain. So you essentially, you, you, you take your, your coordinates, you act by SL2, and then you apply some sort of symplectic matrix to give, bring you back to the fundamental domain. And part of the problem is you don't really know what that matrix is. It's somehow the, the, what the, there is no good formula for it, and the matrix is actually given somehow in terms of the geometry of the surface, which is not so easy to understand in these coordinates. Uh, so now this is very analogous to what happens in the space of lattices. So in the space of lattices, the SLNR modulo SLNZ, you again, you start with the basis for the lattice, you can represent the lattice as an N by N matrix, and then you have columns uh, are, are just the, the basis vectors, so you can. Uh, so now left multiplication on, on, on this space in this coordinate uh, is just, uh, you, you know, what you do is you take a matrix and multiply it on the left by some other matrix. So it's exactly this picture. And then if I want to think about returning back to the fundamental domain, I just act by this co-cycle again. Uh, but there is one fundamental difference. Uh, so, if I, so, so if I, the multiplication by this co-cycle is an M by, is an SLNR. So here I have SLNR acting on SLN, SLNZ acting on SLNR, right? And so this preserves everything inside. It's a homogeneous space. It preserves right invariant distance and right invariant vector field. So this returning to the fundamental domain is a very harmless operation here. It just doesn't really, you can, you can sort of follow what's going on with what it does. And here is maybe, so maybe, maybe what I want to do next, I want to, and now, now Ratner theorem and all, all of the results in unipotent flows are not, usually not so easy. So I'm gonna give, a, you know, it's, it's all the proofs are here, 80 pages or something, and I'm gonna give a one, pa one, one minute version of the proof. So this is not gonna be very accurate. But here, here is a maybe two minute version. So here is how the, the proof goes. So uh, suppose you start with two points which are very close together. And so, you know, if, if, if you have a new, you invariant measure which is not supported on an orbit of U, then you can find two points which are in the support of the measure which are very close together, like X and Y, and not in the same orbit. So then you can apply the flow uh, until they become distance roughly one apart. So you can, you can sort of do that. Now, as, as, as uh, because of the flow is really by this polynomial matrix, uh, you can actually, there is gonna be some time which is gonna be pr 
positive proportion of the time up to here, which is one minus delta t, but th this whole time is t, where these points are gonna be rough distance roughly at least a half. You know, they're gonna be a half, between a half and, wo and one all the way through here. Uh, so they're, they're between a half and one. And also, you can actually c also control which direction they're, th uh, they're going from here to here. They're always gonna be pointing pretty much in the same direction. So n but now by Birkhoff, this red part of the orb, which is the or part of the orb from one minus delta t to t, is actually itself uniformly distributed in the whole space. Which basically means that all these red points are kind of approximate everywhere in the space. And this means that almost every, every, almost every point in, in Gmo gamma has like a friend, which is also kind of in the support of the measure, in this direction v, which is roughly distance one away. And if you work hard on this, you can actually show that this implies that the whole measure is invariant in this extra direction v. So you somehow gain extra invariance in, 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 the, in the problem, and then there's a lot more work, but eventually you prove the theorem. So now the reason I'm bringing this up is because this proof really does not work at all in moduli space. And this is sort of a basic problem, and the reason it doesn't work is because well, because the, really the problem is somehow you have to come back. All of this argument so far, I was actually somehow thinking of like this. I was thinking X and Y are here, and I was flowing, and then they were diverging over here. And I was all, all my argument in the homogeneous setting was done here. And then the return, somehow the distance was preserved when I was returned back to the fundamental domain. So I could tell the distance between my orbits already out here without having to return. And uh, in, 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 in the moduli space, you, you, can't, you really can't do it because if you want to tell the difference between, let's say, UT, even just to tell the distance between UTX and UTY, you have to apply the call cycle first to return to the fundamental domain. There is no globally invariant distance. And then you lose control because you really don't have a formula for the call cycle. And so this is basically says that this, the basic mechanism of the, which underlies the theory of unipotent flows, which is polynomial divergence, really fails. Really, there is really no polynomial divergence in moduli space. And this is sort of a, seems to be a very serious problem, even though a lot of people come out very optimistic about this, but it's, 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 not, it's not, not an easy thing to, to deal with. And now in a view of very special cases, this really doesn't happen. I mean, you actually have polynomial divergence, and this is the, this case. Well, there is some sort of integral formula for this, which is the integral over some orbit. And uh, there is, uh, in the quantitative Oppenheim situation, you count something different. I'm gonna count, uh, I'm gonna call it like this. This is, again, some sort of other formula. And uh, the, somehow the problems look different, but it turns out that these expressions are really the same. That somehow this, they're, they're not, they don't look this, they, they, you can even use the same letters and then you wouldn't know if you, uh, which problem you're working on except one problem is happening on uh, SLN R modulo SLN Z and the other one happens on the moduli space of course. So, and this actually was understood by Veach. He actually understood this while he was listening to Margulis talk about the quantitative Oppenheim conjecture, which is some relation between the subjects. Uh, so, now, since the work of Veach, one, one, one would uh, sort of, one uh, question was uh, what extent can one sort of use the theory of unipotent flows on moduli space? So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, so first, there is a, there is a moduli, sp I mean, moduli space is somehow, uh, Ratner theorem and this kind of stuff is, is really, you expect to only work in very, very nice situations. And now modular space is very nice, has an awful lot of structure. It's certainly not homogeneous, but it's still, I mean, if it's gonna work anywhere, it's gonna work there. Uh, but, uh, so here is one particular structure of modular space which seems particularly relevant. So, I mean, I think I already mentioned these local coordinate systems. So if, you, if I pick a symplectic basis for the relative homology group, then I have this local coordinate system. So I can associate two I associate to a, a point in my space, these kind of, inter, I just integrate my one form along the curve, so I get a, a, something in CN which I wanna write as R2 to the end, so it's a two by N matrix. So now the SL2R action in these coordinates is actually very simple. You 
just you take this is your, your point in your space and just multiply on the left by SL2. But what happens is that uh, this is the uh, somehow if maybe if I should type that as a symbolic picture, this is the fundamental domain, and here is my point X. And when I apply G X, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the fundamental domain. And then if I, if I want to think about my dynamics that's happening on the fundamental domain, then there is, I have to return. And this is, I think, some, this is called the, co the co-cycle. I'll call it AGX. So I return back to the fundamental domain. And this is, this is called the conservage Dorich co-cycle. And it's, it's really the, it's a change of basis you need to perform to return this point back to the fundamental domain. So you essentially, you, you, you take your, your coordinates, you act by SL2, and then you apply some sort of symplectic matrix to give, bring you back to the fundamental domain. And part of the problem is you don't really know what that matrix is. So somehow the, the, what the, there is no good formula for it, and the matrix is actually given somehow in terms of the geometry of the surface, which is not so easy to understand in these coordinates. Uh, so now this is very analogous to what happens in the space of lattices. So in the space of lattices, the SLN R modulo SLN Z, you again, you start with the basis for the lattice. You can represent the lattice as an N by N matrix. And then you have columns uh, are, are just the, the basis vector. So you can. Uh, so now left multiplication on, on, on this space in this coordinate uh, is just, uh, you, you know, what you do is you take a matrix and multiply it on the left by some other matrix. So it's exactly this picture. And then if I want to think about returning back to the fundamental domain, I just act by this co-cycle again. Uh, but there is one fundamental difference. Uh, so, if I, so, uh, so if I, the multiplication by this co-cycle is an N by, is an SLNR. So here I have SLNR acting on SLN, SLN Z acting on SLNR, right? And so this preserves everything inside. It's a homogeneous space. So it preserves right invariant distance and right invariant vector fields. So this returning to the fundamental domain is a very harmless operation here. It just doesn't really, you can, you can sort of follow what's going on with what it does. And here is maybe, so maybe, maybe what I want to do next, I want to, and now, now Ratner's theorem and all, all of the results in unipotent flows are not, usually not so easy. So I'm going to give, a, you know, it's, it's all the proofs are actually 80 pages or something. And I'm going to give a one, one, one minute version of this here. So this is not going to be very accurate. But here, here is a maybe two minute version. So here is how the, pr the proof goes. So uh, suppose you start with two points which are very close together. And so, you know, if, if, if you have a new, you invariant measure which is not supported on an orbit of U, then you can find two points which are in the support of the measure which are very close together, like X and Y, and not in the same orbit. So then you can apply the flow until they become distant roughly one apart. So you can, you can sort of do that. Now, as, as, as uh, because of the flow is really by this polynomial matrix, uh, you can actually, there is going to be some time which is going to be pr positive proportion of the time up to here, which is 1 minus delta t, but th this whole time is t, where these points are going to be rough distance roughly a, at least a half. You know, they're going to be a half, between a half and, and 1 all the way through here. Uh, so they're, they're between a half and 1. And also, uh, you can actually c also control which direction they're, the, uh, they're going from here to here. They're always going to be pointing pretty much in the same direction. So, but now by Birkhoff, this red part of the orb, which is the or part of the orb from 1 minus delta t to t, is actually itself uniformly distributed in the whole space. Which basically means that all these red points are kind of approximate everywhere in the space. And this means that almost every, every, almost every point in, in G mod gamma has like a friend, which is also kind of in the support of the measure, in this direction v, which is roughly a distance one away. And if you work hard on this, you can actually show that this implies that the whole measure is invariant in this extra direction v. So you somehow gain extra invariance in, 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 the, in the problem, and then there's a lot more work, but eventually you prove the theorem. 
So now the reason I'm bringing this up is because this proof really does not work at all in modular SQL. And this is sort of a basic problem. And the reason it doesn't work is because, well, because the, really the problem is somehow you have to come back. All of this argument so far, I was actually somehow thinking of like this. I was thinking X and Y are here. And I was flowing, and then they were diverging over here. And I was all, all my argument in the homogeneous setting was done here. And then the return, somehow the distance was preserved when I would return back to the fundamental domain. So I could tell the distance between my orbits already out here without having to return. And uh, in, 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 in the modular space, you, you, can't, you really can't do it. Because if you want to tell the difference between, let's say, UT, even just to tell the distance between UTX and UTY, you have to apply the call cycle first to return to the fundamental domain. There is no globally invariant distance. And then you lose control because you really don't have a formula for the call cycle. And so this is basically says that this, the basic mechanism of the, which underlies the theory of unipotent flows, which is polynomial divergence, really fails. There is really no polynomial divergence in modular space. And this is sort of a, seems to be a very serious problem, even though a lot of people come out very optimistic about this, but it's, 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 not, it's not, not an easy thing to, to deal with. And now, in a view of very special cases, this really doesn't happen. I mean, you actually have polynomial divergence. And this is, the, these cases were actually worked out some time ago. Here are some Markov, Morris, and me did one case, and Carlton Workman did a different case. These are essentially branch covers of weak surfaces and also other things that are similar to that. Now, Kurt McMullen made very major progress about in roughly 2003 when he was able to classify everything invariant under SL2R and genus 2. And this is done by a very clever reduction to the homogeneous space. I'll actually say more about this a little bit later. But so now I want to say what our main theorem is. So our main theorem is this. Is if we actually try to solve a slightly easier problem than understanding unipotence, we actually make, define a group called P, which is this upper triangular group. A is a diagonal and U is unipotence. And so then we, are, we, have, we have to have, this is all joint with Merriam. Uh, so we want to talk about what are the analogs of the homogeneous uh, actions, homogeneous measures of homogeneous spaces. So we, are, we use the word affine. So energotic measure is affine if in local coordinates it's a restriction of, a, of the Lebesgue measure to some subspace. So, uh, so somehow our, our local coordinate was really like CN, and then is a homogeneous measures are basically locally just restriction to some sort of C linear subspace of CN, so just Lebesgue measure on subspace. And again, the, then you, could, you have the anal analog notions of ma manifold. A submanifold is called affine if it's supportive of an affine measure. So again, Locally, it just looks like a subspace in these in these coordinates. And so, this this the, the main theorem is that if it's basically about p invariant orbits and p invariant uh, measures. So, any p invariant measure is actually automatically SL two R invariant and affine. And so, the so then the orbit the p orbit closure of any point is the SL, also the SL2R orbit every point is always in a fine side manifold. So in particular, the SL2R orbits of points are called the Tegmuller disks. So the closure of the Tegmuller disk is always in a fine side manifold. And uh, then also, I, I'm not going to say who this is, but this, you can imagine what this might say. So now, the reason we really were able to make progress on this is basically, well, in a long time, there was a lot of stuff happening in the theory of homogeneous spaces. Actually, sorry, before I, before I do it, let me say a little bit more discussion. Can you repeat the theory of homogeneous Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I don't mean that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I missed that. Uh, yeah, any ergodic p invariant measure. Uh, so, you have, um, so this is, this is a copy of our theorem, again, with the same omission. So that this, the SL2R case of the first two statements in, is in genus two is due to Kurt McMullen. If he also does something which you definitely don't do, which is give a complete classification of all the affine submanifolds, which I'll talk about a little bit about a little later. Uh, 
is uh, now in terms of the proof, it's it's sort of the most difficult proof, just uh, like just like Kratner's theorem. The most difficult proof is the classification of the of the measures, and then you basically go through from a classification of the measure, you prove some sort of equidistribution theorem, and then you using the equidistribution theorem you prove something about orbit closures, and now uh, the reason you can go from uh, in p invariant measures to equidistribution theorems is because of p is amenable. But also, you actually really need some sort of ad adapting some various techniques of Margulis, actually two different techniques so of Margulis to the situation. And so this is the joint work with Amin Muhammad. Uh, in particular, you actually need just the following seemingly obvious statement, just a little bit annoying to prove, is you need to show that every stratum has countably many affine submanifolds. So this is, uh, so I mean, it's, it's actually seems to, seems to that I, I'll talk about it later, but it seems actually the uh, actual affine submanifold is actually very rare. But uh, for this, you need to show that countably many. Uh, so now, if, uh, in terms of the proof, so how, so essentially, uh, since, I mean, you know, this problem was around for a while and we really couldn't make progress on it. Uh, and it, what happens is that a lot of progress happened in the theory of homogeneous space. This is, this is all modular though. And so th there, there is uh, certainly a lot of uh, developments on entropy and conditional measures which are de uh, developed in the context of homogeneous spaces. Uh, so we certainly use that extensively. But somehow the main strategy is, just to, is basically this breakthrough by Benoit Kahn has allowed us to approach this problem in a serious way, which is this, uh, allowed us to kind of display, essentially they, I mean, one way to think about what they did is they, they gave a substitute for polynomial divergence, which is called exponential drift, and it actually works in the setting. So you can, you can really do stuff uh, in, in the setting using, using, using that technology. Uh, so actually, maybe I will go say a few more words about how to relate this uh, dire more directly. So, so he, I think we already had the setup, but if you start with a random in, in marriage probability measure and defines a random walk, so you can actually go from one step, you go from x to gx, this probability mu of g, and then you, are, you, you can define a stationary measure if mu star nu is nu, when mu star nu is defined this way. And so this is that theorem, is that if the support of mu is compact and the risk is dense, well actually I think it relaxes now, but then any mu stationary measure is homogeneous. Uh, so, and so this is this exponential drift idea. And somehow one, one thing I want to say is that instead of the burkhoff ergodic theorem like I had in the proof where this red line was equal to by the burkhoff ergodic theorem, now it's, it's actually what's happening is the Martingale convergence theorem takes over that part. Uh, so now I want to relate this a little bit more directly to what we do. So there is a theorem of Furstenberg. So if you start with a measure of means called admissible, if it's actually compactly support and absolutely continuous respect to the hard measure. So it's like a bump function. And now Furstenberg proves this very beautiful theorem is that if you have an admissible measure, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between mu stationary and p invariant measure. So, so th I mean, you're kind of very tempted to call it a first number correspondence, but that's taken by something else. Uh, so, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's also somehow, so this allows, you can restate in the following way. So if you start with an admissible measure on SL2, so it's some sort of a bump measure, then any mu stationary measure on the stratum modular space is uh, actually an invariant under SL2 and, and is in fact affine. So that's what, what we're, basically what we're proving. Uh, now, in the Benoit Kant's case, they, of course, the main interest is that this measure mu is not, need not be admissible. Because if it was admissible, then you can use this uh, theorem of Furstenberg because P in, in includes U, and then you could use Ratner's theorem to, if you have U. But uh, in our theorem, we don't have Ratner's theorem, so we are actually happy to just do admissible measures. Uh, trying to do other measures will be even more difficult. And it's actually, I think, I mean, there's very serious obstacles to this. Uh, so now here's a scheme of our proof. So there is a kind of, I, I was very glad that uh, he asked the question of uh, why do we need so much simplicity? Uh, well, you know, in the end of, 
in the in stock, you know, there was at some point for, for, their, for their proof, it's actually very important, I think, for the, somehow we need, in order to apply the technology, we need the, the risky closure of the conserved exhaust per cycle to be semi-simple. And so a priori, that's not clear. And so what we, we sort of do a kind of a multi-step approach. In, in the first attempt is we actually use some sort of argument which is based on entropy. I mean, one of the nice things about our setup is that because we have invariance under both A and N, we automatically have positive entropy. So we sort of used ideas from the work of Heinz Schuster, Katok, and Linderschaus, and also others the, uh, to, to actually use some entropy type argument uh, to show that any P invariant measure is actually SL2R invariant. And then using, after, you know, it's SL2R invariant, the results of Forney show that the, for an SL2R invariant measure, the, the conservative Zorichko cycle is actually, over the entire SL2R action, actually is semi-simple with some sort of geometry effect, which is what actually worked out some time ago. Here are some Markov, Morris, and me did one case, and Carlton Wortman did a different case. These are essentially branch covers of weak surfaces, and also other things that are similar to that. Now, Kurt McMullen made very major progress about in roughly 2003 when he was able to classify everything invariant under SL2R in genus 2. And this is done by a very clever reduction to the homogeneous state. I'll actually say more about this a little bit later. But so now I want to say what our main theorem is. So our main theorem is this. Is if we actually try to solve a slightly easier problem than understanding unipotence, we actually make, define a group called P, which is this upper triangular group. A is a diagonal and U is unipotent. And so then we, are, we, have, we have to have, this is all joined with Merriam. Uh, so we want to talk about what are the analogs of the homogeneous uh, actions, homogeneous measures for homogeneous spaces. So we, are, we use the word affine. So energotic measure is affine if in local coordinates it's a restriction of, a, of the Lebesgue measure to some subspace. So, uh, so somehow our, our local coordinate was really like CN and then is a homogeneous measure so basically locally just restriction to some sort of C linear subspace of CN. So just Lebesgue measure on subspace. And again, the, then you, could, you have the anal analog notions of ma manifold. A submanifold is called affine if it's support of an affine measure. So again, Locally, it just looks like a subspace in this in these coordinates. And so this, this is the, the main theorem is that if it's basically about p invariant orbits and p invariant uh, measures. So any p invariant measure is actually automatically SL two R invariant and affine. And so the so then the orbit the p orbit closure of any point is the SL, also the SL2R orbit every point is always an affine submanifold. So in particular, the SL2R orbits of points are called the Tegmuller disk. So the closure of the Tegmuller disk is always an affine submanifold. And uh, then also, I, I'm not going to stick with this, but this you can imagine what this might say. So now, the reason we really were able to make progress on this is basically, well, in a long time, there was a lot of stuff happening in the theory of homogeneous spaces. Actually, sorry. Before I, before I go, let me say a, few, a little bit more discussion. Can you repeat the theory of homogeneous Yeah, sorry, I, I guess I don't mean that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I missed that. Uh, yeah, any ergodic P invariant measure. Uh, so you have, um, so this is, this is a copy of our theorem, again, with the same omission. So that this, the SL2R case of the first two statements in, is in genus two is due to Kurt McMullen. If he also does something which he definitely don't do, which is give a complete classification of all the affine submanifolds, which I'll talk about a little bit about a little later. Uh, as, and now in terms of the proof, it's, it's sort of the most difficult proof, just like, just like Kratner's theorem, the most difficult proof is the classification of the, of the measures. And then you basically go through from, a, classification of error measure, you prove some sort of equal distribution theorem, and then you, using the equal distribution theorem, you prove something about orbit closures. And now, uh, the reason you can go from uh, in P invariant measures to equal distribution theorems is because of P is amenable, uh, but also you actually really need some sort of ad adapting some various techniques of Margulis, actually two different techniques so, uh, of Margulis to the situation. And so this is the joint work with Amin Muhammad. 
uh, in particular, you actually need just the following seemingly obvious statement, just a little bit annoying to prove is you need to show that every stratum has countably many affine submanifolds. Which is, uh, so I mean, it, it actually seems to, seems to that I, I, I'll talk about it later, but it seems actually that actual affine submanifolds are actually very rare. But uh, for this, you need to show that countably many. Uh, so now, if, uh, in terms of the proof, so how, so essentially, since, I mean, you know, this problem was around for a while and we really couldn't make progress on it. Uh, and it, what happens is that a lot of progress happened in the theory of homogeneous space. This is all, this is all modular down. And so th there, there is a, certainly a lot of uh, development on entropy and conditional measures which are de uh, developed in the context of homogeneous spaces. Uh, so we certainly use that Extensively, but somehow the main strategy is just to, is basically this breakthrough by Beno and Kahn has allowed us to approach this problem in a serious way, which is this, uh, allows us to kind of display. Essentially, they, I mean, one way to think about what they did is they, they gave a substitute for polynomial divergence, which is called exponential drift, and it actually works in the setting. So you can you can really do stuff uh, in, in the setting using 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 that technology. Uh, so actually, maybe I will go say a few more words about how to relate this uh, dire more directly. So, so he, I think we already had the setup. But if you establish a random in, in probability measure and defines a random walk, so you can actually go from one step, you go from x to gx, this probability mu of g, and then you are, you, you can define a stationary measure if mu star nu is nu, when mu star nu is defined this way. And so this is our theorem, is that if the support of mu is compact and the risky dense, well actually I think it relaxes now, but then any mu stationary measure is homogeneous. Uh, so, and so this is this exponential drift idea. And somehow one, one thing I want to say is that instead of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem like I had in the proof where this red line was equal to three by the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, now it's, it's actually what's happening is the Martingale convergence theorem takes over that part. Uh, so now I want to relate this a little bit more directly to what we do. So there is a theorem of Furstenberg. So if you start with a measure of mean, it's called admissible if it's actually compactly supported and absolutely continuous with respect to the hard measure. So it's like a bump function. And now Furstenberg proves this very beautiful theorem is that if you have an admissible measure, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between mu stationary and p invariant measure. So, so th I mean, you're kind of very tempted to call it a first number correspondence, but that's taken by something else. Uh, so, but, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's also somehow, so this allows, you can restate in the following way. So if you start with an admissible measure on SL2, so it's some sort of a bump measure, then any mu stationary measure on the stratum modular space is uh, actually an invariant under SL2 and, and is in fact a fine. So that's what, what we are, basically what we are proving. Uh, now, in the Benoit Kant's case, they, of course, the main interest is that this measure mu is not, need not be admissible. Because if it was admissible, then you can use this uh, theorem of Furstenberg because P in, in includes U, and then you could use Ratner's theorem to, if you have U. But uh, in our theorem, we don't have Ratner's theorem, so we are actually happy to just do admissible measures. And trying to do other measures will be even more difficult. And it's actually, I think, I mean, there's very serious obstacles to this. Uh, so now here's a scheme of our proof. So there is a kind of, I, I was very glad that uh, he asked the question of uh, why do we need so much simplicity? Uh, well, you know, in the end of uh, his, his talk, you know, there was at some point for, for, their, for their proof, it's actually very important, I think, for the, somehow we need, in order to apply the technology, we need the risky closure of the conservative zoolog per cycle to be semi-simple. And so a priori, that's not clear. And so what we, we sort of do a kind of a multi-step approach in, in the first attempt is we actually use some sort of argument which is based on entropy. I mean, one of the nice things about our setup is that because we have invariance under both A and N, we automatically have positive entropy. So we sort of used ideas from the work of Heinz Hizekatov and Linderschaus and also others that, uh, to, to actually use some entropy type argument uh, to show that any p-invariant measure is actually SL2R invariant. 
And then using, after, you know, it's a Saltor invariant, the results of Forney show that the, for an SLTOR invariant measure, the, cons the Conservative-Zorichko cycle is actually, over the entire SLTOR action, actually is semi-simple. with some sort of geometry of technical space coming in here. Now, after that, you pick an admissible measure on SLTOR and consider the corresponding random walk. And then there is a very beautiful result of Givarch and Raji saying that this co-cycle remains semi-simple in the random walk context. This is completely general. And now we can finally use the Benoit Kint exponential drift method to show that this measure is a function. And so this is the, this is the scheme of the proof. And so now what does it say about the actual billiards? Well, so what, what we can show, well, this is not completely done, but what we should be able to show is using this method is that you have, you should have a theorem like this. Somehow if you, what you really want to prove is that, you know, the asymptotic is quadratic, there is a quadratic asymptotic formula would be the second statement over there. But instead of, uh, do, I mean, what we can do is we can actually just show sh sh that this is true after you do an extra averaging. You know C is non negative? Uh, we actually know what C is. I mean, positive? Yeah, yeah, we know C. You, we have, yeah, we actually know what C is. Uh, well, actually, with some, with some caveat. I'll, I'll say it in, in a second. Uh, but uh, the problem is that we don't, we, we really want to have a theorem for you invariant measures instead of a, a U invariant measures. And, but that seems to be kind of very difficult using <coughs> what we know. So, so that's why we can't get rid of this extra average. Uh, so now one of the problems is that, so one of the problems is, okay, so we know that there is an equidistribution theorem. Somehow every orbit is, has a kind of a nice affine closure and it's equidistributed in its closures. But one of the things is, well, one of the questions, what are the closures? What are the affine submanifolds? And uh, so uh, another question is, uh, this is actually very sad, but at the moment it seems that there is no algorithm. You know, so suppose somebody gives you a surface. I want to know if it lives in an affine submanifold or not. And I have no idea what it, uh, how to do that. I'm beyond genus two. So, uh, so here, let's see. So may, may, the, now the Teichmuller curves are the simplest, maybe the easiest part of this question is the Teichmuller curves. They are the smallest possible affine submanifold. They are, the, they are closed orbits of SL2R. And so they're first construction by Thurston and Veach. In, in genus two, there is a complete classification. There is, a, there is one infinite family. It, in, it, this was done by Ecalta and McMullen independently. And this contain, well, pairs where the Jacobian has real multiplication by a quadratic number field. And now in the other stratum where you have a sim two simple zeros in genus two, then the only primitive Teichmuller curve is a regular tangon. This is a theorem of McMullen. By the way, primitive means it's not a branch cover of, a, of another Teichmuller curve, where you just pull back the one form. And now in genus three or higher, the classification problem is still open. There, there are infinite families in genus three and four constructed by McMullen kind of from prim varieties. There is a family by Bohr and Moller, which finds the many curves in each genus. And this family also contains other families which were previously found by Beach and Ward. And then there are very deep finiteness results in H31 and H4 by Bainbridge and Moller. But somehow they're essentially in H31, I believe the result is there are only finitely many algebraically primitive technical curves. But, but there are, uh, this, this, uh, this subject is still very much open. And now about the higher dimensional stuff is essentially nothing is known except for the genus two case. This is McMullen theorem. So you, this is a, and so here's the only other, only non-obvious affine submanifolds are the curves for Jacobian admit real multiplication by quadratic number field with given holomorphic form with eigenform. These are the only examples. And so beyond genus two we have a, essentially everything is open. I mean, somehow the, the consensus seems to be that by talking to experts, which I'm not, is that there should be very, very few. Uh, but uh, at the moment, nothing is proven. I mean, uh, there, is, there, is, there, are, there is an approach to these questions uh, based on variations of Hodge structures. And right now, there seems to be the problem is that where, what we, where we end is not exactly where the algebraic geometries want to begin. There is some sort of gap in between. Uh, and so, anyway, so that, anyway, that's it.
Pinto, a remarkable theorem. Any questions? about the surfaces with abelian differentials on them. What do you know about uh, surfaces and quadratic differentials? Well, for, for the purpose of this uh, particular theorem, it, you should always pass for double cover and consider the same surface in abelian differentials. But then the genus goes up. Yeah, but that's, yeah. But so the classification problem is still very, very interesting, both for quadratic and for abelian. I think it's, it's, it's not, nothing is known. Yes. No, no, it doesn't show itself to break. It shows us to fine. But, uh, but, uh, but it's not, it's not I, I think it's, I don't, I don't think we have a proof that that fine is algebraic because of the singularity of infinity. I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, somehow nobody ever, ever wants to conjecture anything, but I mean, everybody would like it to believe it's true, but. I don't think anybody actually wants to stick their neck out and conjecture. But actually, also, I don't, I don't know if exactly what, I don't think anybody even tried to write down exactly what the answer should be. No, there are no bad examples. How about invariance under N, not just the upper triangular? Uh, you take with us. Yeah, that's what I think what you wanted to ask. No, that's you told uh, you. <laughs> so yeah, even so how much I'm listening to. Yeah, even if you call it ten, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's I, no, I guess no, I'm yeah, asking I, I, the no, same no, question. No. That's believed to be true. Okay. I mean, I don't have. An, I mean, maybe yes, but I mean, the problem with this approach is that you know, if your polynomial diversion doesn't work, and so if you just have an n invariant measure, then it's you're very limited what you can do. I mean, there is some possible strategy for dealing with this, but I I don't know if it works. And you you said you would say something about the constants. Oh, the constants. What yeah. are they? So somehow there, there's a lot. So basically, you know, people are developing a list of these affine manifolds, and whenever you have an affine manifold, you can ask about the constant. And you do the work of many people. Some of them are here. We actually know, for all the known examples, we know what all the constants are. The constant depends only on the old approach. But uh, I mean the. The, the difficulty is if you give me a polygon and you ask me what yeah. the constant is, I can't tell you because I can't, I don't know where it lives. Well, let's thank Alex for a great talk and a great theorem, and Mariam too. Thanks. <laughs>
so now one of the problems is that so one of the problems is okay. So we know that there is an equidistribution theorem. Somehow every orbit is has a kind of a nice affine closure and it equidistributes in its closure. But one of the things is well, one of the questions: what are the closures? What are the affine submanifolds? And uh, so uh, another question is: uh, this is actually very sad. But at the moment, it seems that there is no algorithm. You know, so suppose somebody gives you a surface. I want to know if it lives in an affine submanifold or not, and I have no idea what it, uh, how to do that. I'm beyond genus two, so um, so here let's see. So may, may, the, now the Teichmuller curves are the simplest, maybe the easiest part of this question is the Teichmuller curves. They are the smallest possible affine submanifold. They are the, they are closed orbits of SL two R, and so they're first constructions by Thurston and Veach. And in genus two, there is complete classification. There is a there is one infinite family. It's in, it, this was done by Carlton and McMullen independently. And this contains well, uh, pairs where the Jacobian has real multiplication by a quadratic number field. And now in the other stratum, where you have a sim two simple zeros in genus 2, then the only primitive Teichmuller curve is a regular Tengon. This is a theorem of McMullen. By the way, primitive means it's not a branch cover of, a, of another Teichmuller curve, where you just pull back the one form. And now in genus 3 or higher, the classification problem is still open. There, there are infinite families in genus 3 and 4, constructed by McMullen, kind of from prim varieties. There is a family by Bo and Moller, which finds many curves in each genus. And this family also contains other families which were previously found by Beach and Ward. And then there are very deep finiteness results in H31 and H4 by Bainbridge and Moller. But somehow there are Essentially, in H31, I believe the result is there are only finitely many algebraically primitive Teichmuller curves. But, but there are, uh, this, this, uh, this subject is still very much open. And now, about the higher dimensional stuff, is essentially nothing is known except for the genus 2 case. This is McMullen's theorem. So, if this is a, and so here's the only other, only non obvious affine submanifolds are the curves for Jacobian admits real multiplication by quadratic number field. This given holomorphic form as eigenform. And these are the only examples. And so beyond genus 2, we have up, essentially everything is open. I mean, somehow the, the consensus seems to be that, by talking to experts, which I'm not, is that there should be very, very few. Uh, but uh, at the moment, nothing is proven. I mean, uh, there, is, there, is, there, are, there is an approach to these questions uh, based on variations of Hodge structures. And right now, that seems to be the problem is that where what we where we end is not exactly where the algebraic geometers want to begin. There is some sort of gap in between. Uh, and so, anyway, so that anyway, that's it. Thanks. Thank you for a beautiful talk. Remarkable theorem. Any questions? Yeah. Um, you have talked only about the surfaces with abelian differentials on them. What do you know about uh, surfaces and quadratic differentials? Well, for, for the purpose of this particular theorem, you should always pass to a double cover and consider the same surface in abelian differentials. But then the genus goes up. Yeah, but that's, yeah. But so the classification problem is still very interesting, both for quadratic and for abelian. I think it's, it's, it's not, nothing is known. Yeah. Does your result show the closure of the Teichmuller group to its algebraic? Yes. No, no, it doesn't show it's algebraic. It shows it's affine. But uh, but uh, but it's not it's not I, I think it's I don't I don't think we have a proof that affine is algebraic because of the singularity of infinity. I mean, I, I'm not. Sure. I mean, somehow nobody ever, ever, ever wants to conjecture anything. But I mean, everybody would like it to believe it's true. But I don't think anybody actually wants to stick their neck out and conjecture it. But actually, also, I don't, I don't know if exactly what, I don't think anybody even tried to write down exactly what the answer should be. But are there any No, there are no bad examples. How about invariance under N, not just the upper triangular? If you uh, take with us. Yeah, that's what I think what you wanted to ask. 
No, that's uh, uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, even that's how much I'm listening to. Yeah, even if you call it ten, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's believed. No, I guess no, I'm yeah, asking I, the no, same no, no, question. No. That's believed to be true. Okay. I mean, I don't have. An, I mean, maybe yes, but I mean, the problem with this approach is that you know, if you polynomial diversion doesn't work, and so if you just have an n invariant measure, then it's you're very limited what you can do. I mean, there is some possible strategy for dealing with this, but I I don't know if it works. And you you said you would say something about the constants. Oh, the constants. What yeah. are they? So somehow there, there's a lot. So basically, you know, people are developing a list of these affine manifolds, and whenever you have an affine manifold, you can ask about the constant. And you do the work of many people, some of them are here. We actually know, for all the known examples, we know what all the constants are. The constant depends only on the orbit closure. But uh, I mean, the, the, the difficulty is if you give me a polygon and you ask me what yeah. the constant is, I can't tell you because I, can't, I don't know where it lives. Well, let's thank Alex for a great talk and a great theorem, and Mariam too. Thanks. <laughs>